Anders, hi. Thank you so much for joining us here at Empower. As head of alternative investments um, in your company, what do you see as the development in this area and what do you see as being truly adopted going forward now? Yeah, so I think within the illiquid space of alternative investments, uh, the progress has been slower than within the liquid space, but in some cases it's probably been a little bit less sales driven and, and more authentic to some extent. Obviously, based on investment ne investor needs and LP requirements. Uh, but you can also argue that you can do more direct impact within the private credit and private equity space. So I think we are starting to see a movement there of managers, they usually sign up to UNPRI, they have ESG policies in place and they're starting, for instance, some of the private credit managers are starting to introduce uh, ESG ratchets so basically the company will pay a lower interest rate if they fulfill certain ESG criteria, which is obviously a very direct impact on the portfolio company. So I think you're seeing a lot of the good stuff that is being done, uh, but it's done on a less, less controlled uh, or more controlled sort of sales talk perspective. So you think there's still a lot of room for improvement and there is a still an element of greenwashing that's happening? I think the, obviously one has to be careful with greenwashing accusations, but I think that's probably more profound within the traditional usage space where it's more difficult to differentiate. Uh, there is more competitors. Uh, right now there's a lot of attention to private markets. A lot of managers are oversubscribed. You know, that's a luxury you don't have in the usage space. So there's more fierce competition. You're fighting passives. So one, one way to differentiate for the liquid guys is to sort of boost the ESG efforts and the, the green credentials of the asset manager. And I think some managers are authentic and others are maybe twisting it a bit too much. So what will start to have an impact on that? Presumably some of the regulation that we're seeing coming in. The regulation will definitely. Uh, and I think as, as that moves forward, uh, the taxonomy is gonna help. And I think gradually you'll see managers getting called out by media or by investors that, especially for Article 9 funds, with Article 9 funds, you are sticking your neck out. Article 8, there is you know, room for, for difference of opinion. For Article 9, it becomes more narrow. So I think you know, if, if there is a case, you know, there was the, the DWS case, uh, I think other managers will start to be a little bit more cautious on how they position themselves. And how difficult is this in terms of it being different, different in different geographies though? Because we're talking about one region here and those measures can't be applied across the globe, can they? No. And a lot of these businesses are global. So I think that's a, that's a possibility for, you know, for the managers who are working within one region. Not that Europe is one, it is one region, but it's certainly not one country. You know, investors in the Nordics are very different than the Spaniards vis-a-vis -vis Austrians and so forth, or the UK for that matter. But but it's still it's still possible within reason to distribute one fund within Europe, give and take. But if you start introducing Asia, Latin America, the US and so forth into that mix, you know, so if you're a global asset manager and want to be present in all regions. There, it's complicated to be genuinely authentic on ESG in Europe because a lot of the Europeans will be, they'll be less receptive to, to that story because we won't necessarily tie into what this manager does in Asia or in the US. So with all of that in mind, how are more and more asset managers committing to, to net zero? Because that's what's ha what we're seeing happening, these commitments. How, how are they going to go about doing that with all of, of what you've just said? That's going to be interesting because obviously, you know, by 2050, you know, that's, you know, maybe I've retired at that point and uh, maybe some others are thinking that uh, the same when they sign. Uh, I'm curious to see how some managers will do it. Probably there's some low hanging fruit in cutting certain heavy emitters from your portfolio to make your assets you know, less carbon intensive. But at some point, the easy uh, cuts are done. But I think while it's difficult for me at least to comprehend now, you know, when the iPad came to market, I was a little bit 
I didn't understand what the meaning, you know, why was that such, such a great idea. In hindsight, I was definitely wrong. So I think it's only a matter of time before there will be some landmark technological developments that is fundamentally going to change I I probably more on the environmental side. Watch this space. Really interesting uh, area to, to be in and to be able to have conversations with colleagues at events like this. Perhaps you can start to see some of those things happening. Yeah, obviously now with, and I think there's a lot of capital flowing in, which is obviously beneficial because, you know, it, there's no point if you have a great idea if nobody wants to finance you. So I think you're seeing a lot of green tech funds, you're seeing uh, impact funds that are coming to market and they're actually capable of raising assets. Probably some of them are going to deliver mediocre returns, but it's probably also where you will find the, the next companies that are fundamentally going to really bring change. So I think that is uh, it's going to be huge. It's going to be interesting to talk to you over the coming years as it develops. Anders, thank you so much for joining us. Great yeah. to talk to you. Thank you.